checking it's on red yes it's on red paul welcome to another door podcast it's great to be here ellen it really is i took the chance and approached you to come on because you're a very busy man usually you're here there everywhere australia uh singapore the world and i thought paul might be having a little bit of downtime in this lockdown i'm gonna try and get him on the podcast obviously read all your books massive fan so thank you very much for coming on um welcome it's it's an absolute pleasure and you're right i mean i've um <clears throat> three weeks ago i'd never even made a zoom call um and interestingly enough it i actually have done some podcasts already and doing another couple this week in four organizations in australia without having to leave my own home office so uh, this is an opportunity where I'm not speaking all over the place in terms of my travel and being live in the room. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to do these podcasts and maybe connect with people I've not connected with before. So thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Well, that's one of the things I think, um, you know, it's giving people a new opportunity, isn't it? Fresh thinking and all that good stuff. That's yeah. awesome. anyway. So, Paul, we've just been discussing, I think, we were last in a room together maybe 14 years ago, maybe? Yeah, it could well be that. I mean, my sumo book uh, came out in 2005, and I think at that, so I think it was actually prior to that, because I don't think when I was doing the work with your organisation with at the time, I'm not even sure if the book was out, but it was almost in my earlier days of speaking, really, when I did all those events. Yeah, it was amazing. You, I think you're right, your book came out maybe that year i think so maybe it was right. 2005 um i found you as i don't know how i found you because the internet wasn't really it was probably pre-internet <laughs> yeah i mean the internet would have been around but i don't think people were doing the kind of searches and no. uh, algorithms and all the kind of stuff that now we can find people really easily and i remember even just having a website in 2002 2003 and people going you've got a website you know, and, and in those days, that was even before, um, you know, social media. I, I, I think I'm right in saying it might have been around 05 when YouTube first came into being. So, yeah, 15 years. To say a lot has changed in 15 years is an understatement. A lot has changed. However, the message, your message is still fresh as ever. Sumo, shut mm -hmm. up, move on is just this thing that keeps, I mean, I think it's kind of lived with me for all this time. And I've certainly spread it around as I kind of, you know, have, as I've joined organizations and, you know, yeah. you always find yourself in a situation where you think, oh, we need a bit of sumo in our lives. <laughs> so um, that's what I really wanted to get you on to talk about, because I just think it was that, it was that kind of book. It's totally written in that I really love. It was not mm -hmm. kind of this kind of bullshit stuff that sometimes, um, you were reading at that point in time. It wasn't motivational speakers who uh, perhaps weren't perhaps coming from as much uh, soul or heart that I felt. I just liked you because you came on, you gave it humour, you gave it, you know, you put the person into the problem almost. Yeah. So yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about Sumo. Okay, and I think it's interesting the comments that you make, which I do appreciate. And um, <clears throat> I think where, where does sumo start? It, it starts where before I came across the catchphrase, it, it starts actually in my childhood, which without going into detail was very dysfunctional and was very difficult. And um, the reason I say that and start with that, as I grew into my teenage years and my 20 years, into my 20s, I realised I, I don't know how to do life well. Um, I've got, an, I suppose I've got a lot of baggage in my life. There's maybe things I need to unlearn and it, that was a catalyst. It was almost like the pain was the catalyst for looking for a prescription or for some ideas to, to deal with my pain and to deal with life in a more effective way than I was doing. So I started getting into reading personal development books. And of course, in those days, and I started getting into this, which would have been now like the early 1990s, I'd be in my little Ford Fiesta 1.1 car which are playing cassette tapes. 
Now, if you want to confuse a teenager, just talk about cassette tapes or <laughs> give a cassette tape to a teenager and, and ask them, how does this work? In fact, there are actually some videos on YouTube of young people looking at a cassette tape. It's fascinating. But I, I became an absolute consumer and a sponge for content, for insights, to understand myself. And, and people would, oh, that's all very American, although they didn't say it quite in that kind of voice. And it was, you know, some of my ideas were poo-pooed, but, you know, I lost my job through ill health, through ME or uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, yuppie flu or chronic fatigue syndrome. And I was ill for over three years. And when I got to the point of feeling I could work, not full-time, but part-time, no one would hire me because I couldn't pass a medical. Uh, so I hired myself. And I, what I would say is this, even before we get onto sumo, the ideas I started to pick up, in my days of, of learning, which still continues to this day, you know, in my first year of business, I turned over £2,300. I paid no tax, no national insurance, and my accountant sacked me. But I kept listening to the cassette tapes, getting that inspiration. I kept looking at the, uh, reading the books, and, and things did evolve, and it was the kind of the springboard or the stepping stones, as sort of like stay in the game, Paul. Because what I realized was what I was reading was having such an impact on me personally because of the kind of a lot of the challenges I've had. And so I was passionate then. I was passionate when you first heard me speak in 2005, and I still am now because I'm still learning. My, these ideas I come across are still helping me and they're helping other people. So that's the kind of the, uh, the backstory, sumo itself, literally, as you've mentioned, it would, well, it's just a catchphrase to begin with, shut up, move on. And I am wary that some people will immediately go, love it, shut up, move on, which you did. But there'll be other people who go, well, I think that sounds rather aggressive. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so, but I wanted to really unpack that, you know, the shut up bit. Sometimes you do need to shut up that inner voice of, that's always criticizing you. We need to sometimes shut up that moaning and start moving on to solutions. But also shut up is almost can be quite gentle. It's like, hey, shut up, take time out, stop, think, reflect, press pause, and then think about moving on. Now we do sumo now in education as well. And just so people are aware, there is an alternative definition mm. to it, which is stop, understand, move on. And really what the, as a catchphrase or as an umbrella term, what had happened during my days of being in my Ford Fiesta, uh, learning stuff and, and then reading books, is I began to, I suppose, my own thoughts and ideas began to evolve and develop and I'd have my own take on things. And then Sumo became almost like this umbrella term that I used to describe my ideas and they, they became what I call my Sumo principles. The book came out in 05, 2005, having been rejected by 13 publishers. And... Um, quite you know there are things that happen in life and you can't take the credit for it you've got to say maybe i got a little bit lucky then i've worked hard had a lot of belief but for whatever reason some man or some woman in wh smith's in 2005 went i like that i think we should make that business book of the month and my thoughts were when the publisher told me was it's not even a business book it's a personal development book <laughs> and they went Paul, WH Smith's want to make it business book of the month. It's a fucking business book, okay? And I'm like, yeah. And what's really interesting was I didn't have a goal. My goal was, could I get into some like WH Smith's in airports and railway stations? It never occurred to me it could become a business book of the month. And it never occurred to me at the time, which happened a few years later, that it would become a Sunday Times bestseller. So um, it's been an interesting journey that I'm still, I'm still on, still learning, love learning, love love people people fascinate me technology doesn't you know the fact that we can do this zoom thing if you said can you do a webinar and show loads of slides i'm like eleanor uh, i've left the building and, and maybe i could at some stage but at the moment what i just really love doing is is kind of talking to people like yourself sharing with your listeners and um just talking about maybe some of the struggles i've had but some of the ideas i've learned along the way to help myself and help other people so it's um I, I'm very passionate about it. I think it's fair to say. I think it is fair to say. I think that's really fascinating what you say about like where it came from, like that seed. 
Um, and you know, what you've just described is obviously really relevant to another book. Door closes and you've got space and you can do anything you want in that space. You might feel like you don't have a lot of options, but you have all the options. You can panic, you can be scared, you can feel positive about it or, you know, whatever. You're this kind of sumo um, comes from that seed in itself, mm. doesn't it? It comes from that kind of feeling of I'm going to choose what to do right now. Sure. I think I'm, it is fascinating. I never knew this. Someone contacted me and um, was very complimentary about, yes, about sumo, but how clever I was in the fact that I've come up with this term sumo, which as you know, Paul, as a word in Latin means choose. And I'm like, I had no idea it meant that. <laughs> and when you talk about making choices. I didn't know that. No. <clears throat> well, I didn't at the time, but I'm taking the full credit for it now. Yeah, it means. Yeah, I mean, that's where it came from. Yeah. yeah. But actually, the point <laughs> you make is, it is a fascinating one, but there's quite a lot of complexity around it because our choices, you're right, do have consequences. And I appreciate we become responsible for the, ch the choices we make. But I'm also aware that none of us are starting this journey necessarily from the same place. And it's a bit like if you want to get to drive to southern, Sp to southern Spain and, and, and you set off from, from somewhere in uh, northern Spain and I'm setting off from Scotland we're both on the same journey trying to get to the same destination but we started in different places and i think one of the things that i want that i've learned is just to have a bit of compassion where people are at maybe at the moment because you know you've got your three you know you've got your, your what i call the three u's you've got your your uncertainty the unknown and the unpredictability of life throw in that sense of overwhelm throw in that sense of things are changing rapidly and, and, and recognize that, yes, you know, it's quite easy. I say it's easy. It's perhaps easier for me as someone who's understood how our brain works, who's got a set of tools, who has a home with a, with a decent sized garden, who has family support. It is perhaps a little bit easier to kind of go, I need to make some good choices here. Yeah, because actually you've got an environment and a history uh, and a support system that, that helps that happen. But I'm also aware some of your listeners right now might be on their own. They might be in a seven floor flat. Um, they might have had some, you know, real challenges and disappointments. They might not have really, until they started subscribing to your podcast, even thought about personal development and attitude before. And so, yeah, th their, their choices are also important. But I don't want to kind of like, you know, bully people into this. I kind of want to almost like just encourage people in a very gentle and hopefully compassionate way to go, we are navigating some incredibly difficult times, but there are some things that we can use. And for some of us, maybe those tools are quite familiar, like they are to me, and they've helped. But for others, maybe we're discovering things for the first time so I think what I want to always do and what I say is frame it with a sense of compassion and kindness and recognizing that we are on this journey. Our choices do matter, but where we've started the journey is different compared to maybe some other people and just to have that awareness. Yeah, I think that's really important, isn't it? I think, and we really feel that at the moment that everybody, especially, you know, what, what we're dealing with right now, but also how we deal with any kind of change in life in general, we come from a very different space, don't we? We all come from a space of maybe fear and uncertainty, but we translate it in a different way. Um, there's one thing in the book that I really loved and it, again, it stuck with me way back when and, and way back when, when I first discovered your, your book and your work, I don't think I'd really read a lot about self-help and all that stuff, as you say, it was really new, but this concept of hippo time, yeah, I just absolutely. love that. And that is relevant to yeah. everyone. To, and, and now we're hearing it all the time because it's, you know, a sense of kind of yeah. gives. But where did that come from? Because that was quite new at that point in time, just to, to tell everyone it's okay to kind of, you know, take time out. It, yeah, I, I'd started to <clears throat> write my ideas um, about the book and 
you know, developing fruity thinking, you know, besides God, if you believe in God, the most important person you're going to talk to is yourself. And, and, and so that had evolved and this little formula had come across E plus R equals O, it's the event plus my response or our response and it's the outcome. But a, a, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine said, I'm loving how this book is evolving, but there's something missing from it. And he said, you can't always literally shut up and move on immediately. And sometimes there are things that happen. He said, I don't know what the answer is, but you need to go away and think about it and process it. And I happened to be at a speakers conference one weekend. And on the Saturday afternoon, I just went back, I was going back to my room. I just needed a bit of a brain break. And I, I bumped into a friend of mine, a big rugby league fan called Steve. And he was talking about how his team, Leeds Rhinos, had just lost. This was like in an October time. I uh, just lost in the grand final. Um, and he was telling me, he said, and you know when you get home and you just want to have a right good old wallow. <laughs> and he was saying it and he started to say the rest of the story because his wife had gone, oh, well, never mind, Steve. There's always next year. And Steve was gutted. He was, I want to I wanna feel how I feel. And, and he mentioned this word wallow. And it just activates something in my mind. And I kind of like, he carried on talking for another minute. And I went, and my brain was just buzzing. I went, Steve, I've got a cap. Can I catch you later? I'll buy you a drink in the bar. And I went, yeah, whatever. And I went into my hotel bedroom, got a pen and paper out. And I just had this phrase, hippo time is okay. And it was, it's interesting because I think the Samaritans now use something like this phrase. It's okay to not always feel okay. Yeah. I'm sure I didn't originate it. But I started to use that phrase that yeah. hippos go into mud, they need to wallow. It's about getting out the heat of the situation, cooling down and, and just letting people know, you know, to feel mad, bad, sad it is part of being human. And I think a lot of people who are motivational speakers will be labelled with, he's going to come on or she's going to come on and they're going to tell us why we're going to change the world and this is positive and this is a gift. And, and I think positivity is important. I think there could be some gifts within the crisis, but we also need to, I suppose, go back to that point before about compassion and self-compassion and go, yeah, but I'm not a machine, you know, where you pull a lever and everything's great. I am a human with my feelings. And, and if you suppress those feelings, those hurts, that pain, long-term, that isn't good for you. And so I talk about, you know, sit, sometimes you need to sit with your sadness or mm. process your pain or digest your disappointment and, and just allow yourself to not necessarily be overwhelmed and, and ruled by the feelings, but not to deny them. And the other part of hippo time is, is actually just give people permission to say, you know what, it is okay. I mean, losing your job, you know, I mean, you are going to need some hippo time. I lost my job through ill health. When I was summoned to head office, um, and my wife had to drive and was like, lead me into the building because I was so weak and fatigued. But I just thought they'd say, let's just give this six mm. months and then you're back. But they kind of went, it's over. This is the end of the story. This is the end of your journey working with us. And, and maybe if I'd been part of a union, I could have uh, worked with that. But that was, that was a very, very difficult and devastating mm. experience. Well, it's not a question of, Choose your attitude, let's be positive. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to get to that point, but right at that moment, I needed to kind of like, yeah, I need a bit of hippo time. However, and maybe we're going through this at the moment, many people, it's okay, but it's temporary. Mm. And my message to people is, you know, having to have that wallow, it, it's, it's fine. It's part of your journey. But the problem is, I come across some people, is it becomes their destination. It mm. becomes where they stay. And it's, it's, it's a process to work through, not to stay in. That's the fascinating bit. And that's the bit that, that then brings out the rest of it in the book and all the other books actually that you've, that you've written that, yeah. um, you, and then you actually do see people who then get stuck in the mud, which again, let's keep that because it's such a great picture, isn't it? You kind of just, mm -hmm. you just get stuck, but, but you're actually okay, happy, stuck in the mud. Yeah. And that's the worrying bit, isn't it? You know, you, you, sometimes you feel it yourself as well. It's like, oh my God, I'm so comfortable right now with everything going wrong. It's not fair. Well, it's all right for them. 
and you know you hear yourself saying mm. these things and you think oh my god i'm just stuck right here you, one of the things i've learned in life generally is this phrase i use mates matter massively and, and mates may indeed be the people in your inner circle so i mean i talk about the fact why might you get mm. stuck in the mud because you get joined by your hippo buddies and they all, <laughs> all get used to and it's like it's comfortable and there's almost a degree of comfort and it's cathartic to moan about life and everyone's the same and we'll just blame Boris or whoever else is in charge. But I think also, so it's about who's in your world to make sure that they support you, they show solidarity, but they don't encourage you to stay stuck. Mm. But I think also mates now, I want to widen that definition. Mm. It, mates are also, it's the podcast you listen to. It mm. is the book you read. It is the TED talk you watch that, you know, what are we choosing to do? I mean, a phrase, again, I've started to use more. It's not in the book, but manage your mental diet. Mm -hmm. we, there, there is a tendency, if we're not careful, one of consuming what I call too much CNN, constant <laughs> negative news. But, you know, you can, be, you can be lost at sea and you can die of thirst and yet you're surrounded by water. And at the moment... We can be surrounded by water, but it, it's salt water. It's not good for us. It'll, you'll dehydrate, you'll become ill, you'll die ultimately. If that's all you consume. We need to look for the pure water. And I think what the salt water is, in terms of what I mean now, is fake news, just the spreading of fear and speculation, which happens through, uh, you know, through social media and other aspects of the media. And, and people thinking about the future uh, and not not focusing on it in a way of what the potential is and the possibilities, but just using our imagination to almost like fuel our fears even more. Mm. And so I am choosing to think, I'm not putting my head in the sand, I'm not deluded, I'm not in denial, but I'm kind of like thinking, okay, you know what you think about our physical diet and what's good for us? Well, what's good for me to consume? So this morning, um, I, I did a little bit of study and some, some learning. I... Um, prepared for, for this uh, podcast, I, um, I then went for a walk and it's a beautiful morning and um, we're quite semi-rural where we live and I was listening to a Brenny Brown, a Greeny Brown, a Brenny Brown podcast, fascinating as I keep on stopping and taking notes on the phone. By the time I come back, it's like I've had a good start. Now that isn't because of, you know, well, you're just a positive person. That goes back to your initial point. I made some choices. I sat out with an intention today of what I was going to do. And I'm feeding my mind, not with fears, with speculation of future, but feeding my mind with things that are going to nourish me. And, and when challenges come, as they will for all of us, and it, it's like, well, maybe it puts you in a better position to deal with those challenges. You know, I, I, I had the virus and it hit me quite hard. I was ill for, for two weeks. And, um, but one of the things that I suppose, you know, I was fortunate, I didn't, I, it, from a terms of being prepared, I was fortunate I didn't have any underlying health problems. Yes, I was fortunate that I wasn't in my eighties and very frail. Um, but also hopefully I was fortunate in that up until that point, I'd kind of looked after myself okay. Now I appreciate some healthy people have been taken out by this awful virus, but maybe there were certain things I'd done and my mindset that helped me not to go, well, if you've got the right mindset, you'll get over this, because that's not how it works necessarily, but it, it, it can mm. help you deal with things, not conquer things, but deal with them perhaps a little bit more effectively. If I'd have not been looking after myself, if I, if I hadn't, if I just, you know, just said, well, this is, you know, being unhealthy in all my life choices, then maybe it could have hit me even harder. So I don't want to take any credit because the virus is the virus, but did I give myself a 5% better chance of dealing with this virus in a more effective way? Possibly, I don't know. And I think in life, it's not just about intervention when the problems occur, but what can I do to prevent the problems occurring in the first place? And you can't, and, and if you think about it with a the virus, there are things, preventative measures we can take. So, I don't know, I'm, I'm beginning to ramble a fill here, Eleanor, but I think we'll just, there's a mixture of in life generally, some of it's out of our control and sometimes it falls well for us, even though it was out of our control. 
But I just want to encourage everybody that there aren't, there's that circle of influence that Stephen Covey talks about in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There are things within our control and I am choosing on a daily basis to focus on those rather than on the things I can't do anything about. Yeah, never apologize to ramble. I think rambling is like the best thing sometimes <laughs> in that space between, whether you're just like getting a notebook out and just shriveling like what is going on in here or just talking to someone without any expectation or polished stuff. I, I love a yeah. good ramble. So oh, yeah. don't apologize Thank for you. that. <laughs> on to the your the other book that i've got um by my bedside and i've been picking up quite a lot and and actually um i'm going to send it to someone um this week how not to worry because yeah. obviously right now worry is a theme that people are just kind of thinking well i'm a, i'm okay with with okay i get that we have to be in this situation that we're in but I'm worrying about what happens next and how not to worry that whole book um, around the three different types of worry really helped me kind of get yeah. my head around what's going on. So could yeah. you just like give us a little bit, I know it's like, <laughs> it's got so much in it, but just that summary, how sure. don't you worry? I think, okay, if I take a step back to something that's not in the book, which might still help people, uh, is something which I've been developing in the last two or three years. There was another book, not by me, but by a guy called Daniel Kamen called Thinking Fast and Slow. And he talks about two systems in our brain, our fast and our slow. Now, I often represent when I'm speaking the fast brain. It's like, I'm going to show this big red baseball cap. And for me, um, so what that red baseball cap, your fast brain, is where your, your fight or flight or your freeze response is. It's, part of, it's our primitive emotional brain. And I think first of all, let's stop and understand that we still have that as part of our brain. It's fast, it's automatic, instinctive, it reacts, it's only bothered about the short term. But the thing to be aware of when you're in that red cap is sometimes act first, think later, value feelings over facts, is that we are in the 21st century, we are in 2020, and yet part of our brain, our hardware, is an ancient brain that evolved and developed on the African savannah 150,000 to 200,000 years ago. So be aware of that because that's gonna then give us some insights around worry in a moment. But there's another part of our brain called your slow brain. I represent that often with your blue baseball cap. And that's where you do your rational, logical thinking, where you analyze things, where you maybe plan and prepare ahead. Now, the fact is, at the moment, we need, it's not good or bad, the red and blue, it's just is. And sometimes we can use our blue cap to kind of like put the brakes on the red cap running away with worst case scenario. But what, what I want to think about now then is our red cap, which above all is all about survival and protection, to say it's on a high alert, given all that we're faced with at the moment, is an understatement. And again, I'm not going to say to people, and that's wrong. Now, that's part of how it is. But what we need to learn is, is to understand things a little bit more and understand how if we can bring our blue cap and our rational, logical way of thinking into the conversation that's gone inside our head, that will help us. What's really interesting to think about in terms of worry, there's a lot of different messages in the book, but I talk about anticipatory stress, mm. and which we could call worry. In other words, the event hasn't happened but I'm using my imagination to imagine the worst case scenario. And that's red cap kicking in and, and, and bringing that and that release of, of cortisol and the adrenaline. But the thing is, it's just stop and understand, flip an act. Our brains cannot tell the difference between a real or a vividly imagined event. So the event might not happen. All this speculation about this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Well, we don't know. It's good to be prepared for things. Of course it is. But what can happen is red cap emotionally hijacks us and we're on, this, we're on this road, this path, and we can become completely overwhelmed with that. So you've got that, that kind of like, I've got that worry about what might happen in the future, that anticipatory stress. You've also got what I'd call um, situational stress um, or, or situational anxiety, if you like. And that is, right, we are actually in we're in a current event. So I'm not just talking about the coronavirus, but 
if you are driving around London and you've never driven around London before on a, on a busy work day, that could trigger stress in you and worry and anxiety because I don't know where I'm trying to find the venue and I've got people beeping at me. And the thing is, it's like that's the situation. But as soon as you find your car parking space and then you walk into the venue, you relax. So there's like a beginning and there's an end. Now, what we've got with the coronavirus is we're in a situation and we're in a situation where you've got to be really careful about, you know, making sure you, well, they call it social distancing. I prefer the phrase physical distancing. Um, you've got that situation where someone gets the virus like I did. But until you know you're recovered from the virus, you can be concerned what's going to happen whilst you've got it. The thing is, as soon as I start to recover, whatever worries I had went because the worry was based on a situation. So you've got number one, anticipatory stress. Keep thinking about the future. You've got situational stress or worry, but you've also got um, residual worry or stress. So in other words, it's happened, it's over, but you keep on reliving it and retelling it. And the extreme example of that is where people talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, there is a school of thought that says, actually, there's another way of thinking about when you've gone through some really painful stuff, but it's not necessarily a stress disorder, but, it, but there's now something called post-traumatic growth. So actually through this, you could grow and strengthen and become more resilient and more adapt adaptable. But there's another two things to bring into this equation, and I hope you can, people can just take a little bit of time to sort of like process, but just to recap what I've said, you've got that red cap and blue caps, part of who we are, we just need to sometimes acknowledge blue cap and get it involved a little bit more in our thinking. You've got anticipatory stress, you've got situational stress and residual, in other words, the event's over. But when people say to me, yeah, worry, you know, you should never worry, one, that's not necessarily realistic because sometimes that red cap gets you prepared for what could be a potential threat. If you're alone at night walking down a road and you see two figures walking towards you and all of a sudden you're thinking, I'm concerned here about my safety, that's your red cap triggering a reaction and what you might call anticipatory stress. You know, that, that worry, that anxiety could be very much, um, you know, valid. And so in the book, I talk about two other types, what I call another couple of types of worry, worth it worry and worthless worry. I think for me to decide to visit my 78 year old mother or my 85 year old father who, you know, live, don't, are no longer married and live apart and who have underlying health issues. I think it's, I've got every right to be worried that if I had visited them, and I have not any kind of like spatial uh, social distancing. I could be worried that if they were to get the virus, they might not cope with it as well as I did. So I consider that to be worth it, worry, mm. which is why I haven't visited them. And that if I do, or when I do, to say I'm going to make sure there's a distance between us is an understatement. In life, though, there's also what I call this worthless worry. It's when you, um, I suppose, it's like if you're on a plane and you suddenly get worried the plane's going to crash. Well, but you know what, mate? You can't do a lot about that. <laughs> I mean, unless you're a pilot, there's not much you can do. And, and maybe there's some things that are happening now and you go, well, you can worry all you like about that, Eleanor. You can worry all you like about that, Paul. But at the end of the day, you can't do anything about that. So it's kind of worthless because all it does is, um, is weaken your well-being, increase your anxiety, and, and does not put you in a good place to deal with what's happening now. Worth it worry is when you go, no, actually, the fact I'm a little bit worried or concerned about that can actually give me the, the motivation that can be the catalyst yeah. that can put the backside to take some positive action to do something. So I hope that gives mm. people a little bit of maybe just greater understanding about what's going on in our brain and, and how we use language in quite a lazy general way, you know, worry. And when someone goes, well, what do you mean by worry? Yeah. And we automatically ne attach negative labels to things, which 
aren't always helpful. I think you're right. Worry, um, we use it a lot. And as, as you've said, you know, it gets dismissed, doesn't it? So, oh, stop worrying. Yes. But, but actually, that's what I really liked about your sort of definitions, that worthless, you know, don't spend energy on something that you can't control. But actually, yes. some mm -hmm. worry, you know, is, is right and it's worth it. But, but almost sort of embrace that and in itself will make you feel all right about using that energy on it if that makes totally. sense. Totally. Yeah, because you know I mean? it kind of calms you down just thinking look I am worried about that and that's all right. But also I'm worried about it and that's all right so what can I do yeah. to influence or improve the situation? So there's lots of organizations doing scenario planning about well if we return to work end of May what will mm. that be like? What about if it's in June? What happens in July? So I would almost call that worth it worry because what it means is when those scenarios, which one happens, you're not panicking, reacting out of red cap, but you've already engaged blue cap to look ahead and to plan. I came across this phrase, we just sometimes do a pre-mortem, not a post-mortem. And, and a pre-mortem is just to kind of go, okay, what potentially could go wrong here? And people go, oh, stop being so pessimistic. Well, I prefer to call it, being prepared mm. and, and therefore when you anticipate something that could maybe not go right you then start to maybe take some certain actions and you're more prepared you you have alternative plans now that doesn't mean you'll eliminate all your problems but it just puts you in a better place where you go okay i am calmer i remember going to i had an early morning flight to lisbon with my family and i was speaking in glasgow the night before i thought fine the, the day before as i thought Thought, no worries, I'll get back in time. Then the client says, no, it's a pre-dinner talk. Um, you're on it, you, you, it'll finish at 7.30. Then I find out I'm not in Glasgow, I'm about 25 miles from Glasgow doing the event. I had my last train home was 10 past eight that evening. And I'm thinking, as soon as I finish speaking, I have 40 minutes to get to the railway station, to get home at time, to make the early morning flight. I was worried. So what, because I thought I might miss, might miss that last train. So that was, okay. And I actually said to myself, okay, so do a pre-mortem. What could go wrong? What could go wrong is the meeting starts late. People want to talk to me after I've spoken. There's a, the, the taxi's late. There were all kind of potential problems. And I'm thinking, I need to do what I can do to influence that situation. I can't change the timetables of the train. But I said to the client, here's my situation. Would it be all right if we start 15 minutes earlier? So I finish at 7.15 rather than at 7.30. They went, absolutely. Then I said to the people in my office, if I'd still miss the 10 past eight train, are there some alternative trains that won't take me home, but will take me within commuting distance to get a taxi or be picked up by the family? When I did that event, I wasn't worried about will I make my train? I'd already done the pre-mortem, anticipated things maybe going could go wrong, and I thought of what I could do if they do. And I was able to focus purely on my talk and give of my best. And as it happened, I got me trained. I had a nice time in Lisbon. But, <laughs> so I just want to encourage people that, you know, that red cap can just get you to become quite illogical and irrational. Mm -hmm. And we just need to kind of like take that deep breath and go, I need to focus on some possible ways forward here. Mm. I, I think as well that that energy, what you just described, sometimes um, it comes in very short term things as well as long term things you might be worrying about. So things like um, not very relevant now, but uh, you get maybe cut up in a traffic jam or something like that. Like it, it's almost obviously it's not worry, but it's coming from that same Ah, what if I crash? What if he could have, you know, he could have, yeah, done it. He could totally. have you, you've suddenly like triggered. I like that red cap thing. That's a great way of describing yeah. it. You've triggered the red cap to say, what if this, what if that, da, 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 and you've used all that energy on what? And, you know, I've really tried to work on that kind of reaction over the last few years because I just think what a waste of energy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, why do we do that? <laughs> in a rather dramatic way, but actually an accurate and truthful way, there are people in prison today because someone cut them up in the traffic, they got into red cap, they ended up not being able to access blue cap at all, they got completely overwhelmed with anger, 
Um, and that, that led to some of your some violent confrontation. And it's like, whoa. And all right, you think, well, that doesn't happen to me. No, of course it doesn't. But people, you know, what some of people, when they're in that red cap, can be behaving in incredibly bizarre ways. Mm. And whether that's being cut up in the traffic or someone took a parking space. And yeah, so I do, I, I use it as a visual metaphor because I think what I've built my brand on is, is just make this simple and accessible. Yeah. This is not about trying to impress people with theoretical and abstract ideas and models. It's about saying, can I use that? I mean, could even teach your kids about the red and the blue cat. Yeah. You know, and so I, I, I'm a fairly simple bloke in, in many ways. And um, I, I got, you know, I didn't get exactly lots of qualifications at school. So for me, it takes a while to grasp things. And, and I had to come to the like unpack stuff in a way that I can get. But then what that means is I then hopefully can communicate that in a way to people from all kinds of ages and backgrounds in, in hopefully what is a, a, an easy and accessible way. And they go, I could do something with that. That And I think that is something that will just stay with me. You're like, How many times do we re react really quickly to something? I'm going to just put my blue cap on. Yeah. Every single time now, you know, every time you think, ah, what you, you know, you react really quickly, blue cap. And, and it is, <laughs> and it is, it is thinking about that. And it's not always, to be fair, and again, we've got to be honest here, it's not always easy to access no. blue. The red cap is a lot stronger in terms of, I mean, Dr. Steve Peters talks about in his book, The Chimp Paradox. Yeah. You get like, my red cap is almost the equivalent of your chimp. So it's, but, it, but it's just knowing that I've got to try and get the blue cap. And I'll sometimes in conversation with my wife who I work with in the business is go, okay, I was very red cap then. I apologize. Or, okay, you got my red cap reaction to that news about something. I'm just going to have to take a little bit of time to think mm. about the blue cap here. And, and things like, you think, you know, even things like how much sleep are you getting? Are you making decisions when you are tired or when you're, you're fresh and, and, mm. and, and well rested? All of those can be clues to help you kind of go, why is it at times I find it hard to access my blue cap in the first place? Yeah, I absolutely love that. My daughter's going to thank you for that. You know, spilt <laughs> drinks. It's fine. It's fine with spilt water all over the carpet for the seventh time. I've got my blue cap on. <laughs> yeah, but it's better than when you, at least it was only water with you. It's the red wine. <laughs> the definite red cap. <laughs> every time <laughs> um thank you paul um we're kind of running out of time i've taken all your time up um and i know you've got other stuff to do today so thank you very much um what piece of advice i always ask you this, what piece of advice someone's in that space in between a doors closing in whatever uh form that is in in their life at the moment what's the one piece of advice you would give to them to say uh, you're in this space, what do you do? How do you get through it? Okay, I think it's um, it's just acknowledging it. So I don't know whether this will, this will, if it's one piece of advice, Eleanor, it is kind of a convoluted one piece of advice. But I think it is that recognition that, all right, that door is closed. I might need some hippo time. But, you know, there are other opportunities out there there are other doors which i'm never going to know if they will open until i move forward and start trying to push them and i think that's my kind of piece of advice and to recognize that what you are going through is not unique to you you're not a one-off it's and this always happens to me that the disappointments and setbacks that you deal with, we all have to deal with in many ways. Sumo became a Sunday Times bestseller, but I had to deal with 13 publishers saying no one will ever buy it. And I think we just need to sort of be kind to ourselves when we're faced with the scenarios we're faced with. Just think, okay, I need my hippo time and that's okay. But also I value myself so much that this is not the end of the story and there will be a new chapter. So, and I seem to say, you know, if you woke up feeling tired and miserable, just remember this, you woke up. So dust yourself down and, and seize the day. And if I had the 19th piece of one, one advice I give you, because I'm giving you so many, is that every time I got a rejection for my book proposal, I made a decision every day 
that I would do something to either research another publisher I could contact, or I would actually find a publisher I could contact, and I would post out my proposal to them. So going for those little wins, finding those doors and beginning to push them is also a great way of m making sure you don't spend too long wallowing in hippo time. That was a very long convoluted one piece of advice, but I hope there's some wisdom in it that you find helpful. There's, there's everything in that. Thank you very much, Paul. Have a good day indoors oh. <laughs> on your Zoom. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. And if people, do, all right to mention, if people want to get try and make contact with me. Absolutely. And I'll put all the links in all of the uh, yeah. comments as well. Yeah. And yeah. the books, obviously, all the links to the books, which I promote quite a bit anyway. But yes, yeah. tell them where to find well, you. Yeah. I mean, one thing is for the moment, I don't know when this is going to go live, but at the moment, between me and the publisher, we've made that book, How Not to Worry, available for free on yeah. Kindle. So um, it's not, you know, I literally, I don't get anything from it other than the satisfaction of hoping the book helps people. The publisher has basically also said goodbye to all their profits for a limited time. So, you know, get onto, you know, Amazon or wherever you download your books from and on Kindle, it's accessible, it's free of charge. So it's definitely guaranteed value for money. And um, in terms of making contact with me, um, at the sumo guy is my, my address on Instagram and Twitter. And the sumo guy is my website. And I've got a YouTube channel that you can get via the website. So I hope that proves of benefit to people. Well, it's all good stuff. And I'm a huge fan, as you know, all these years. And thank, thank you. you so much for coming on. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Take care. All right. And you as well. Take care, Emma. Thank you.